So stages of recovery. On the left, we see the stages of recovery of addiction. And on the right, you see the stages of recovery for trauma, which number one for trauma is safety and stabilization. And two is remembrance and mourning. And then three, stage of reconnection. Um, we're going to talk more specifically about stage one. Um, but it basically, again, involves having that person have a very sense, strong sense of safety. Because something happened in that abuse or assault that disrupted their belief system about safety as it relates to themselves, how they interact with other people, and in general, the world around them. Remembrance and mourning is a stage in which we take the survivors through their trauma account. And we talk with and work with them through that, where they can experience again the emotion that was felt there and deal with it on a proper way and experience that range of emotion and learn to manage that and regulate that. The reconnection is being able to take the skills and moving forward from victim to survivor role and translate that and on improving day to day functioning. Okay? So in early recovery, <coughs> Um, for clients who are in early recovery, early recovery meaning addiction and recovery, the focus of the trauma work should be on stabilization, safety, and understanding the links between trauma and substance use or abuse, not telling uh, the traumatic story. So again, this will be kind of what your role would be in terms of when you're working with those clients who disclose to you or that you know that they are sexual abuse or assault survivors. So it, it make sure that your focus, again, is on those things, helping them understand what the connection is helping them reestablish um, safety and stabilization, and not on telling the story. Um, clients in that process then become very become strengthened, they gain support, and they're helped to learn new coping strategies before going on to later stages. Okay, make sense? Okay. So what happens during that stage? Safety and stabilization. It's establishing physical and psychological safety and helping the client feel understood and safe within a therapeutic environment. Um, addictive behaviors are framed as unsafe behaviors which need to be worked through. So in terms of what should happen first, <clears throat> whether they come to see us or come to see you, um, preferably they come to see you first and get the ball rolling. Um, then midway, when you, are, see, when you see they have been established and they seem safe and they're stable at the moment, it's okay then to add us onto their treatment plan, okay? But not before they work through that. Um, inability to feel the fullness of an emotion is something that's difficult in this stage. Um, being overwhelmed by emotion leads to coping me method of disassociation. Everybody know what that is? Yeah. Okay. Um, for the addictive survivor, the use of alcohol or drugs is the primary method of disassociating. Okay. <clears throat> the resolution of um, impeding danger, which is active addiction, is active danger. Trauma memories will not resolve. So if they're still actively using, it's going to be very difficult for them to work on the trauma piece. Okay. So if they come and say, it's, I, I know, you know um, I'm, used, I'm being triggered to use by my memory of my assault or my abuse, I want to go work on that and then I'll come back and see you all, um, and discourage that. Because when they get to us, we're going to be, um, be hesitant about helping them to bring up those very traumatic issues without any skills on what to do with them once, once we kind of tap into that. Um, ability to distinguish between I am safe versus feeling safe. Um, so addictive survivors use alcohol and drugs to resolve internal danger. Okay, so we want to teach them the difference between the two. Um, development of skills for self-soothing or grounding. Um, I know that you all are using TRIM in your IOP groups, so self-soothing should sound very familiar. That's some TRIM language. Okay. So some challenges in treatment uh, when it comes to a person that has a dual issue. Um, Abstinence may not resolve the trauma-related disorder. Um, PTSD symptoms will often worsen instead. Okay, so keeping in mind that a person feels if I can just stop using, then this will go away. Um, then it's surely the case. What happens is a lot of those things that were buried and kind of repressed will come back up. Okay. Um, women with PTSD abuse the more severe substances and are more vulnerable for a relapse of both conditions and repeated trauma. Okay. Um, confrontational approaches exacerbate, exacerbate mood and anxiety disorders. Um, high correlation between childhood trauma and borderline personality disorder. Um, those of you seeing children, adolescents, you may know that. Some of you are seeing adults, adults with that disorder. Um, they may have disclosed already some childhood trauma. Okay. So some approaches to, to treatment when again addressing um, an addicted survivor is to use trauma-informed systems, which are services that take into account knowledge about trauma, its impact on um, interpersonal dynamics and paths to recovery, 
and incorporate in all aspects of service delivery. Trauma-specific services, which are what we are, um, focus and address on the impact of trauma in a person's life and facilitate trauma recovery and healing. Okay? So in providing trauma-informed services, which is what the goal here seems to be, um, is to make sure that you see trauma as a defining and organizing experience that can shape a survivor's sense of self and others. Okay, so again, it's um, making sure that you yourself understand what is incorporated when we talk about trauma. How is that impacting the person in front of me or the individuals in my group? Um, creating an open and collaborative relationship between providers and clients, placing a priority on client safety, choice, and control. So it's making sure that the client is involved in every process of their treatment. Um, because again, when we talk about the sense of power and control that was taken or lost during their assault or abuse, everything that they do is an effort to help reinforce or, re or empower them. So if they have a choice, would you like to go and, and you know, receive services at this particular place? This is what I'm recommending. What do you think? Um, so giving them that opportunity to even speak that or voice that or discuss that with you. Um, and give them options. You know, here's this particular place, here's that place or that place. Which one would you like to select? So even something that simple can have a very um, big impact on that person. Um, integrate understanding of trauma and substance abuse throughout the program. Um, simultaneously address trauma and substance use. So again, it's when that person is at that point of safety and stabilization, they may still have some more time in treatment with you, but it's okay to add us in as long as that stabilization and safety piece is done for them. Um, ensure clients' physical and emotional safety. <laughs> okay. Um, focus on empowerment by empowering clients to engage in collaborative decision making. Um, recognize that ancillary services are a necessary component of comprehensive whole person uh, interventions. Provide trauma training for all staff and institute screening tools that identify clients' trauma history. And I know that your assessment tool does already.